Welcome to the 21st MD Edge Sitecast. In this edition, Dr. Lorenzo Norris returns, and his guest is Dr. Joseph Pierre. Dr. Norris and Dr. Pierre discuss dual diagnoses and how to treat them in the real world. And don't forget to stick around for this week's edition of Dr. RK with the talk on, well, words. Here now, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. I'm Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry. Today, I'm privileged to have Dr. Joseph Pierre with us to discuss the challenges of treating dual diagnosis patients. Dr. Pierre serves as a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. Pierre also serves as the Chief of the Hospitalist Psychiatry Division at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. Dr. Pierre, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today on the MD Edge Psychcast. Uh, thanks for having me. Okay. So, Dr. Pierre, um, in reading your recent article um, that was um, published in Current Psychiatry, which can be found on the MD Edge uh, Psychiatry um, website, you have give us a great discussion in regards to the challenges of working with dual diagnosis patients. And I was wondering, Dr. Pierre, if you could tell us a little bit about your own history or experience in terms of working with uh, dual diagnosis patients. Sure. Um, so my story is that uh, about uh, 20 years ago, I finished residency. Uh, at that time, my career interest or goal was to uh, become a clinician and a researcher, and my area of interest was mostly with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. And uh, the position that was available when I graduated was at uh, a VA hospital, large metropolitan VA hospital, and specifically working in a dual diagnosis uh, program. Now, this was an interesting program. It was actually started out of research grant funding about a decade earlier uh, and was specifically looking at the comorbidity of schizophrenia and cocaine dependence. Uh, mm -hmm. This was in the early 90s where, of course, the cocaine epidemic was quite rampant here in Los Angeles and in other places. And so I took that position based in, on my interest in schizophrenia but actually didn't have a lot of addiction experience from residency at that time. You know, 20 years ago, there wasn't actually a lot of training in addiction medicine within psychiatry residency compared to the way there is now. There were very few uh, pharmacotherapies that were FDA approved for the treatment of addictive disorders. And so that was really a learning experience for me to be in a new uh, clinical setting that focused on dual diagnosis patients. And so the article I wrote really stemmed out of some of the uh, impressions that I formed through the years working in that program uh, and a lot of things that mismatched between what was written about in textbooks uh, regarding how one ought to treat patients with dual diagnoses uh, and limitations about the ability to do so in the real world. Sure. Well, you know, Dr. Pierre, as you were speaking about the, our training and going back to residency, and you talked about real-world challenges, one of the things that I realized as I, as I got out of training is that, for me at least, it feels as though, uh, particularly in an inpatient hospital setting um, where I was practicing at GW Hospital, dual diagnosis was the rule and not the exception, whether or not you had a dual diagnosis unit or not. And navigating, if you will, again, that idea of of what actually works in a real world, real world setting as compared to what you may either see at a textbook or even in a more specialized clinic where you have all of the resources available to you. It's really, to be honest with you, it's, it's quite daunting. And similar to, I think, your experience where you may have started out with a certain mindset in terms of you're going to be working with this certain patient population, um, I wouldn't be surprised if many people in our audience uh, through their various paths or journey have in realized or interacted in, in with a population where they're going to have to really be astute and competent in treating uh, those with serious mental illness and dual diagnosis. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of that idea of real-world treatment versus textbook treatment. Mm 
Sure. Well, let me just say two things in response to, to your comment. Uh, the first mm -hmm. is I completely agree that the comorbidity, uh, the evidence is that the dual diagnosis patients or patients with co-occurring disorders, substance abuse disorders, and another major psychiatric disorder uh, is a huge uh, problem. I mentioned that I was most interested in uh, schizophrenia at the time, uh, but data from the epidemiological catchment area study uh, suggests that the lifetime prevalence or the lifetime risk of a substance abuse disorder for a patient with schizophrenia is nearly 50 percent. Absolutely. Uh, and it's higher, it's higher in other disorders. So we know very clearly that patients with uh, non-substance abuse disorders, that they're at great risk uh, for substance abuse disorders. And for, for some people, it is indeed the rule. Uh, and that may be more so in, in certain settings. You know, I, I've always done quite a bit of inpatient work uh, in addition to, to some outpatient work and certainly in the inpatient uh, population, that seems to be, um, uh, that, that comorbidity seems to be especially high. And we know that that's one of the many things that, um, that, that uh, does happen with the comorbidity that we tend to see, for example, more inpatient hospitalizations, more relapses, more healthcare dollars spent uh, treating both disorders. So I definitely agree with you that you're, you're, it would be pretty hard to have a practice that didn't involve dual diagnosis patients because they're everywhere. You know, um, and as, and as yeah. you said that, I just wanted to interject because depending on one's path or journey, again, it is very difficult to not have or encounter dual diagnosis patients. In my role, I've been you know, privilege in that I could work in the hospital, but also work in an outpatient practice with a quote unquote different patient population. But this is, and again, this gets into that idea of what you said, real world versus uh, textbook, but also it speaks to me sometimes biases we have to be mindful of. I've encountered over the years, and probably many of our colleagues who practice outpatient psychiatry, is that actually I have a high number of patients in my outpatient private practice setting um, you know, fee for service um, that are dual diagnosis, it just isn't necessarily as overt, at least on initial presentation, as it is in an inpatient setting. So even though at times when I thought I was transitioning, you know, to outpatient and I you wouldn't necessarily have to deal with dual diagnosis, in many ways recently, I can't speak for other people out there in the audience, but I feel so I'm in certain ways dealing with it even more. So uh, with in certain ways as a uh, when I'm doing when I'm in my outpatient setting, in certain ways less resources. So um, that's kind of when you were talking. I, I really did think about that idea of, you know, we really it, dual diagnosis and co-occurring disorders definitely are present, and we in trying to figure out an evidence, knowing an evidence-based way and approach to work with our patients to serve them is really something that we have to be focused on. Yeah, and and that's exactly one of, one of the big areas of mismatch when I talk about textbook treatment versus real world mm -hmm. treatment is that uh, the majority of certainly pharmacotherapy studies for disorders like schizophrenia or either other major mental illnesses, uh, one of the most common exclusion criteria for for participation in those studies is uh, active substance abuse, and historically yes. some some studies have require uh, have even uh, excluded simply having a diagnosis of substance abuse, whether active or not. More recently, studies will often require three months of uh, sobriety or abstinence from substances mm -hmm. in order to be in a study. Uh, but if you're working in a dual diagnosis population, that might be you know 5% of your patients who have three months of sobriety. So what that means is that one of the huge challenges is that, the, that part of the evidence base we have to treat patients uh, may or may not apply to, to our specific patients. And of course, the reason why those patients are excluded is because, uh, for example, that uh, active substance abuse might interfere with the therapeutic, effect, uh, mm -hmm. therapeutic effects of medications. So you don't want that to, to have that in a research study. It's going to contaminate your results. But as a clinician, that's a reality that we deal with all the time. And I think for me, uh, when I started working in dual diagnosis, uh, as I mentioned, I didn't 
I feel like I didn't get a lot of training within residency. Mm -hmm. It was definitely an ongoing process once I was a attending and a faculty member to teach uh, myself and to learn from my colleagues about uh, addiction and about uh, dual diagnosis. So one of the most enduring findings from that research literature is that the most evidence-based practice in dual diagnosis is what we call simultaneous and um, integrated treatment, meaning that you're treating both disorders simultaneously and they're really being treated by the same group of clinicians rather than doing it in parallel fashion by clinicians located in different places or who might not really even be in communication with each other. So I was able to work in, as I mentioned, a previously research-funded study that was really modeled under that design to, to have simultaneous and integrated treatment. But uh, most of my colleagues who graduated with me, who went into private practice, who worked into other settings, they didn't have access to those kind of programs. Uh, and in the paper I reference that there have been some studies looking at the availability of those kind of so-called state-of-the-art programs across the country, and in fact, there's very, very few of them. So, so while the textbook says this is the best way to treat patients, it might be very challenging in a as a clinician if if you are in private practice or if you're not uh, working in an a, a, um, academic setting where programs like that might be available, you're pretty strapped in terms of really being able to provide what the textbooks say is, is the best treatment. You know, I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, and I um, really focus on, because some people in the audience may not know exactly, you know, what an IDT uh, program is, but that idea of simultaneous and integrated uh, is huge because many clinicians, myself included at times, depending on where you're at, you're not able to do that. You would do what you just described as that parallel treatment. If I'm understanding you correctly, you would treat the patient and then you might refer them out, if you will, for either uh, the behavioral treatment for their substance use disorder or to a separate clinic. But what I'm hearing from you is that that is actually, that's not simultaneous. That's not integrated. That's parallel. Um, right. And what, we're, what you're talking about is that the, it has to be a team approach an integrated approach. In certain ways, it reminds me of, because um, I was fortunate to be trained in DBT, and I thought one of the magic, the, one of the key components of or the magic of DBT, when you're really doing it correctly, is that the therapist and the skills trainer and everybody is all on the same page, and everybody's working as a team. And when you describe IDDT, that's what I think of. Um, but you are absolutely correct. It is very difficult to find programs that actually practice that model um, that you could either refer a patient to um, or even if you yourself wanted to actually maybe even try to start one, it's very difficult, I'd imagine, to find clinicians trained in that model who have the time and who can get the reimbursement for it. Absolutely. And, and I think there's so many other things that are done in practice that, you know, people are definitely doing the best they can, but they're just suboptimal. So some of those examples might be, you know, I think more so in the old days, but oftentimes clinicians might see a patient for, let's say, depression, but it's also occurring in the context of alcohol dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we call it alcohol use disorders now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so occurring, occurring along with the alcohol use disorder. And uh, historically, there might have been situations where a clinician said, look, you know, I can't really assess your depression or I can't treat it until you're sober, so go get sober. Go get into AA and go get treatment for that, and then we can come back and talk. And, of course, that would represent uh, sort of an example of the least best treatment. Um, but I think similarly, even today, some clinicians are, are strapped in their ability to provide care for the addiction part of that equation uh, beyond just referring out to other places. And I think in part, sometimes because some clinicians are in situations where they're primarily acting as prescribers, oftentimes mm -hmm. they'll fall back on the pharmacotherapeutic options. You know, here's some naltrexone for your alcohol disorder, um, mm -hmm. but that oftentimes is not an adequate part of uh, multimodality and, and, uh, and multidisciplinary treatment that can optimize uh, outcomes. So I'm certainly sympathetic to the fact that there just aren't state-of-the-art programs out there the way I think there ought to be given how prevalent the comorbidity is. And so I think clinicians are doing the best they can, but there, there is certainly this mismatch between what is evidence-based to be the best treatment and our ability to provide that treatment in a lot of settings.
You know, and Dr. Pierre, if you could please ex- uh, just comment a little bit further in regards to that situation. That particular situation, that idea of referring your patient out someplace so that they can either get their treatment for their uh, co-occurring use disorder, substance use disorder, um, I, I myself have personally done that, and mm-hmm. I find it very... I prefer not to. I find it very dissatisfying uh, because, one, I think you can lose people to follow up. Second, I think that at times, if if it's not done correctly, that sense of the shared collaboration, that relationship can get disrupted. So what recommendations or suggestions would you have with for clinicians who do not have immediate access to, um, if you will, an IDDTP? um, What recommendations would you have for them in terms of how they can navigate this and working with a dual? diagnosis patient? Yeah, well, I think we have to uh, approximate the best treatment uh, Mm. that's recommended as much as possible. So, for example, I mentioned earlier that that it really wouldn't be recommended to defer treatment for one of the two dual disorders uh, Mm -hmm. until one of them's addressed. So that's the idea of simultaneous. Regardless of whether or not you can administer treatment in an integrated fashion, you're going to want to do it simultaneously. Now, there's a caveat to that. That's assuming that it's well established that there are, in fact, two disorders. But if one does have a patient with both a substance abuse disorder and some other comorbid psychiatric disorder, then you might be, you might be, you might have to refer out for part of that treatment, but you want it to be done at the same time. You don't want to say, okay, go get sober and then come back and we can talk and address your anxiety or your your depression. So that's the first part. Uh, The second part is that if you are referring out, if it's impossible that the treatment's integrated because you're not working in a setting that's multidisciplinary and you have different uh, specialists working on different facets of the problem, then at the very least, you would want to make sure you're on the same page, you're communicating with those providers, you're checking up to make sure the patient's actually going to receive that treatment, you're also um, uh, make, making sure that certain things aren't falling through the tr- uh, uh, certain things aren't falling through the cracks. For example, which which of the two providers is uh, taking responsibility for doing your intoxicology testing to monitor mm-hmm. for sobriety? So I think that I mean that that potentially is a lot of work, and that that's sort of the downside of not having integrated treatment. But in the absence of an integrated program, those are some of the things we might do to get us closer um, uh, to that model. Okay. Um, Again, just repeating back what I heard there, I mean, that idea of simultaneous, if I'm hearing you correctly, if I have a patient suffering from depression, um, and uh, again, this is hypothetical, who also has an alcohol use disorder, what I'm hearing from you is don't wait for them to necessarily get sober or the three months. You should be treating both disorders, provided that you've done a careful diagnostic assessment in parallel at the same time, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, I mean, the, the devil is certainly in the details. So uh, so I think that that's true, uh, but especially when you have some certainty that you're dealing with two disorders. I think okay. real, uh, another challenge for clinicians is you might have a patient that you've met for the first time. You may not have a lot of good past psychiatric history in the form of medical records and such. A patient comes in, they, you know, you often know uh, that they have the substance abuse disorder. That's often not in question. Um, and then the question is, aha, is this, does this patient actually have a depression or an anxiety disorder or a psychotic disorder, or is this a drug-induced syndrome? And so um, there's a situation where you might argue that you might have to clarify that before wading in with the treatment of both disorders. And because I've worked... Mostly in an inpatient setting, I understand that I've had the luxury of being able to follow patients longitudinally when they're sober, because they're not, of course, Mm -hmm. usually using substances in the hospital. And then you can kind of see, you can do this prospective experiment to see whether or not symptoms dissipate. Uh, That often is very, very difficult to do as an outpatient, and then that sometimes can leave clinicians feeling like this is not an answerable question, whether or not there's two disorders or one, and people assume that there's two diagnoses and then treatment proceeds accordingly. So I'm certainly not advocating for that. I'm advocating for um, simultaneous integrated or close to integrated treatment when we know there's two disorders. When we we know know that there are two. 
mm-hmm. then you definitely want to do some detective work and, if possible, some prospective longitudinal follow-up to see whether or not there are indeed two disorders. And that concludes part one of the MDH Psychcast on dual diagnoses. And now, Dr. Renee Kohansky. Thank you, Nick. They say sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. I submit quite the opposite is true. Words start wars and words end wars. Hi, I'm Dr. Renee Kohansky for the MD Edge Psychast. Words are the singular distinction of mankind. Language separates us from other beasts. Some may argue other species have language, but there's a difference between language and communication. The defining difference and topic of this program is words. From language comes thoughts and creation. Helen Keller has said that before she had words, there was nothing. In her book, The World I Live In, she describes life before words. I did not know that I am. I lived in a world that was a no world. I cannot hope to describe adequately that unconscious, yet conscious time of nothingness. I did not know that I knew aught, or that I lived or acted or desired. Powerful and profound thoughts. One could argue that the integrity of a man is ultimately his word, that one doesn't actually have their word, they are their word. In this world of internet, interconnectivity, and pseudo-anonymity, we sometimes act as if our words don't matter or don't actually belong to us, that there are things and not people on the receiving end of these sometimes charming contributions. Yes, we do have to keep our own selves in check, Now let me be clear, I am talking about actually choosing our words. A great example can be found in parenting our children. We've all had a kid do something that maybe they weren't supposed to do, and it's actually adorable, but we definitely don't want to reinforce that behavior. We want to send a message that what the child did was wrong. So what do we do? We hide our laughter, and instead we choose a stern voice and admonition. The admonition is essential. Let me suggest something else. On the topic of words, we may have an incredible opportunity to contribute. Maybe even on the macro level, our special sauce is the ability to not judge, to question, to explore, to push on the very edges, and to challenge, regardless of topic. We can create openings into discussions and maybe even invite people into a conversation of exploration. And I'm talking about outside of our professional role as psychiatrists. It's just a thought. Or maybe a word. I'm Dr. Renee Kohansky for the MD Edge Psychcast. And that wraps up the 21st edition of the MD Edge Psychcast. We'd like to thank Dr. Pierre for talking with Dr. Norris. You can find the link to Dr. Pierre's article on dual diagnoses by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to come back next week for part two when they talk about avoiding clinical errors. For Dr. Norris, Dr. Pierre, and Dr. Kohansky, I'm Nick Andrews, and this is the MDS Sitecast.